Hello everyone, my name is Rob and I'm a postdoctoral scientist based in Vienna, Austria. Let me introduce the team I interviewed. Uh, so my name is Maxime Jumont and I'm product manager for ScanWatch and, and more generally for all the watches that we do at Withings. My name is uh, Romain Kersenblatt and I worked in the applied research team. We look at the, at the sensor part of the, of the product. So I'm Paul Edouard, I'm a data scientist at, uh, at Quitting, part of the, the machine learning team. This video is the second part of the interview I did with the Withings team about the scan watch. In the video, I asked them questions about sleep. Specifically, I asked them about the introduction of REM sleep tracking in the scan watch, how the sleep score is calculated, and how the watch detects the moment you fall asleep. In the second part of the video, we talk about sleep apnea and breathing disturbances. I should mention that they're all part of much bigger teams consisting of dozens of people. So many more people contributed to the development of the products and the algorithms. Let's get started with the interview. But as always, I do not want to waste your time. So timestamps are in the description below and also on the timeline. So my next set of questions is about sleep. And the first one is, how would you compare the sleep tracking of the, the sleep mat, which is one of your other main projects, or the, the sleep analyzer, to that of the Withings scan watch? Is one more accurate than the other, or does it actually detect a different thing? Or yeah, how should I compare the two? They're very different. You wrote in your question that they're both based on heart rate and movement, um, which is not true. The, the actual uh, sleep uh, algorithm on the watch is, is only based on actigraphy, uh, not on heart rate. It's just based on movement, basically. It's just based on movement, yeah. We have ongoing studies, uh, clinical studies, to, to record PSGs of uh, healthy people and uh, develop an algorithm on the watch that would use heart rate on, in addition to actigraphy. It wouldn't use only heart rate. Uh, we are able to measure heart rate, breathing rate, and heart rate variability on the watch. The variations of, of, of breathing rate during the night is, an, is an, a very important factor on, for, for sleep staging, so that would be a, another thing we, we would use. And yeah, of course, uh, of course, on the on the uh, sleep mat, we have a very accurate breathing rate. So uh, without much of a doubt, as it is right now, the the breathing sleep is is more accurate. Um, it's also better to detect when you enter the bed and when you leave the bed. It's just a lack of movement that you use to say this is sleep onset. On the scanner, when you're very mobile. Uh, this this are safe and and we use heat because there there would be heat variations uh, when people go to bed. So with the scan watch currently, it detects light sleep, deep sleep, and awake. So no REM sleep. Is there a reason why REM was not included yet? Basically, it's because we do not use that rate. The short answer is that it's very hard to to do uh, REM sleep. One of the goals of the clinical study we're conducting on on, on scan watch uh, is to gather enough data to use that rate and thus um, improve light, deep, and uh, IM uh, detection. Mm -hmm. so, so the stages as they are now, so light and deep, are they what we classically call deep and light sleep, or are they just an indication of how deep your sleep was at that moment? Uh, since, since you have no, no REM sleep, of course, it's not the, the classical uh, thing. But um, I think light is light, and uh, um, deep uh, could be interpreted as deep and uh, REM sleep, but we can't differentiate between the two. During uh, REM sleep, rapid eye movement, so your, your eyes move very fast, but the rest, the rest of your body is, uh, is totally mobile. So in, in the heart rate, you see a lot of things uh, happening, but on the, on the accelerometer, uh, you're standing still. And that's why uh, without the, the heart rate, it's very hard to differentiate between deep sleep and REM, and REM sleep on, the, on our watch. So how did you determine the sleep score formula? In fact, there's only four scores that are aggregated in the sleep score. Mm -hmm. Which four are aggregated in the watch? Duration, which is most of the, of the score, regularity, depth, and the number of interruptions. How would you actually recommend people use the information they get from sleep staging? Like in the morning, they see I had, I don't know, 40% deep sleep, 60% light sleep. The major information by far is, um, is sleep duration. That's mostly what you should look at. So for, for the sleep score, does it work also on people with sleep problems or is it mostly calibrated to people that normally have healthy sleep? Is it also the goal in the end to be able to, for it to work on people that have actually sleep issues, they have trouble falling asleep or, or something like that? As it is right, right now, the, the, the formula is, is, is quite straightforward. Uh, as I said, most of the uh, points are valid if you have a, a good sleep duration. So the question is, if you have a sleep disorder, will you have a long sleep duration or not? Um, 
if you suffer from insomnia, for instance, and the, the, the watch detects that you have very short nights, you'll have a, 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 a poor sleep score. But like insomnia will be difficult to detect probably or not, because people are laying in bed, they're just not sleeping. We have, we have ongoing projects regarding insomnia to, to, to get better at that. The, the question is, uh, can we accurately detect the sleep uh, stages of, 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 uh, of these people? And if we can, then the sleep story is uh, relevant. If we fail at, at sleep staging, yeah, of course. Of course not. To summarize, basically, it would work very well for people that have relatively normal sleep, but that when they're in bed, they're most of the time also asleep. And when they get out of bed, the watch will detect it. It's a good way of tracking how long you are in bed and how long you are asleep, as long as you don't lay in bed still the entire night without moving, but you're awake. Yeah. For, for, now, for now, yeah, that's true. In, in the future, yeah. to, improve, uh, to improve that, but for now, uh, that's a good summary, I, I guess. And is this done on your local device or is it sent to the server, calculated on the server and back to your device? Most most of the computations are, uh, I mean, at three things in general, most of the computations are done uh, in, in the devices. And in the case of uh, ScanWatch, ECG uh, treatment is done on the app, activity recognition and is done on the app. All the rest, uh, as far as I know, is done uh, in, in the device. So you ran clinical trials for the SpO2 and the ECG. Did you also have to do it for sleep apnea? So for sleep apnea, uh, it's in progress. To certify something like sleep apnea, you need a lot of nights, labeled uh, nights, uh, a lot of people, <laughs> basically. And you, it's a night, you know, maybe a six to eight hour recording. It's not something mm -hmm. you do as easily as with a 30 seconds SpO2 or ECG measurement. So it can take a few months to gather enough data. So at the moment, you're not allowed to say in the app if somebody has sleep apnea or not. No, we can detect uh, breathing disturbances, uh, but we, we don't have a certification for sleep apnea detection right now. But the, the sleep analyzer has the certification already or not yet? It does. So the sleep analyzer uh, was launched uh, you know, earlier, like a few yeah. years ago. And uh, so we had the time and we went through this very long uh, study with like hundreds of people. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to do the same now with uh, ScanWatch. But it's in the works. Yeah, it's in the works. Yeah, of course. It's been slowed down because of COVID, because a lot of the uh, sleep labs are closed right now. So the ones, the one we were using has closed uh, to welcome COVID patients. But as soon as they reopen, we can go on with the study and get the certification. Just to add, uh, I think our wish was to, to have the sleep apnea detection on the watch when it was released. But then with the COVID, we, we decided to release the watch without this uh, very major uh, feature. We'll, we'll do our best to, to make sure sleep apnea uh, uh, is released as soon as possible. There are breathing disturbances during the night and... How does the scan watch actually detect this? Is this purely based on SpO2 or do you also use other data to detect these breathing disturbances? There's a lot of things happening during uh, an apnea event. You, you talked on your video on the aura ring about the arch IV, like the, the, the device mm -hmm. heart rate that can happen when you, when you breathe. During an apnea event, you either not that breathe if it's an apnea or in an in hypopnea event, you, you, you breathe less. This modulation of heart rate by the respiration becomes less, uh, less visible. So this is one thing you can you can look at in the PPG signal, the, the amplitude of the of the of the HIV basically. So that's one thing. You often uh, have decreases in heart rate during apnea events. On on, uh, on many people, you will see uh, you see a decrease. You often have uh, motion at the end of apnea events, like um, people are moving a, a little bit. So you can look for signs of that on the accelerometer signal. We are also able to look for signs of uh, breathing rate on the PPG signal. And we can look for signs of reduction of the amplitude of the breathing impact on, on PPG. So there are many, many things that, that, that happen on top of just the SPO2 signal. That being said, the SPO2 is a, is a, is a, major, is a major factor. All, all these are, are, are put together and, and trained to replicate the labels on hundreds of, of pre uh, recordings. To summarize, you, you actually trained the neural network based on professional sleep polysomnography on a lot of people where doctors scored when there was a sleep disturbance 
And then you train your neural network to say, hey, I know in this moment there was a breathing disturbance. Try to fit a model that can actually predict this. The, the exact uh, way it works, it is very hard uh, with our signal to, to say that there's um, an apnea event at a specific point. Uh, but what we can do is to look at a, a zone, a zone of, of signal, like maybe two minutes, five minutes, something like that, and try to estimate the density of apnea events in, in this area. Because uh, when you suffer from sleep apnea syndrome, uh, what happens is you have long periods of the night, maybe one hour, two hours, something like that, with repeated um, apnea events. You breathe for 15 minutes, seconds, you stop breathing, you breathe, you stop breathing. There's a pattern, you know, a pattern that repeats itself. So the network is quite good at uh, looking at a, a large portion of signal and, and looking for patterns, and then uh, based on these patterns, estimating uh, the density of, of apnea events in, a, in an area. Just to mention it, everybody has to some degree some breathing disturbances during the night or almost everybody. So it shouldn't be worrying if you have a one or two. No, I think that uh, one or two is fine. And under, under 15 usually is fine. It's very cool to hear what the people at Withing still have planned for the product. I'm happy that the sleep algorithm will be further improved, though with the pandemic still raging on, this might take some extra time. Also, for those people potentially suffering from sleep apnea, it's good to hear that sleep apnea detection will come too. In the next part of the interview, I asked the Withings team about SpO2, heart rate variability, and heart rate measurements. Until then, thank you so much for watching and see you in the next video. In my videos, I do scientific tests on different devices like the Aura Ring, the Fitbit, and the ScanWatch. And in the end, I hope to use tracking to improve my life. So if you like that subject and like this video, consider subscribing to my channel and also consider giving it a thumbs up because it makes it easier for other people to find my videos. Thank you so much for watching. I'll be releasing the other parts of the interview in addition to my normal content. So stay tuned for more testing of wearables. With things that not support me in any way for making this video, except for kindly donating that time.